<laughs> Welcome this week in Missouri politics. You would think a short week in the Missouri legislature, but it turned into a long one. But the guy that ended it, Senator Caleb Brown, is joining us on the show this week. Uh, now, Senator, welcome back. Thank you, Scott. Always good to be with you. So I just want to jump right into the thing I think everybody's watching this morning for. You went, and uh, for the whole session, you've had a lot of Senator Shaw holding the floor. In one way or another, it's always been come back to manage care, an issue that he feels passionately about, passion on both sides of it. But different times, he's questioned the motivations of some of the supporters of managed care. Um, you took to the floor in what I think most folks thought would be a relatively late night, a rare Thursday <laughs> late night, and maybe even a Friday, and started an inquiry, and you questioned some of his motivations. Can you tell our viewers kind of what the motivation, your motivation was behind the inquiry, what you brought out, and what, what, what happens going forward? Well, I think yesterday wasn't, for me, it wasn't about Caleb Rowden versus Rob Schaff. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it was about something a lot bigger than that. And as you said, um, we've seen, you know, over the course of this session, in the Senate, we've talked about this, the Senate's rules are designed to kind of tie us up. And that, yeah. that's kind of the nature of it. We're the cooling and saucer. Good things about that, and that right? is a great yeah. thing, frankly. Being the pragmatic, deliberate, thoughtful body is a, a really, really good thing and very needed. Um, but what we've seen, you know, yesterday specifically, Senator Schaff was filibustering a blue alert bill, which is a, you know, pro, <laughs> pro law enforcement mm -hmm. um, bill. And he which was, he'll probably vote for, right? Well, he will. And, yeah. and he was doing that by just reading a book. And so, and, and certainly the motivation for him was just to delay. You know, I mm -hmm. think it was a, meant to be a, a moment of chaos among many moments well, he said of it chaos. was a retaliatory thing against the House for a bill. Right, earlier in the right. Day. And so, you know, I think for me it was about uh, something that has really informed my first few months in the Senate. We had a freshman orientation mm -hmm. um, when, after we got elected, so our freshman class was there. Um, Peter Kinder, Victor Callahan, Jim Mathewson, Chuck Gross were all there. Great, great uh, session we talked about. Well, states, uh, yeah, talked about written and unwritten rules. But the thing that really stuck out to me, Victor Callahan said, Democrats today uh, are abusing their power with the filibuster. And then Peter Kinder turned around and said, Republicans today are abusing their power with the PQ. And so you think about that message and those messengers. Yeah. Uh, I think that informed kind of how I'd like to be as a senator, but also how I'd like to see the Senate operate. And so for me, yesterday was about you've got two paths forward. Either we're going to work hard to do the work, to build relationships, to have relational capital. And so when we get into these moments of conflict, um, we have the, the foundation of trust and the foundation of relationships that I think moves us past some of these other petty mm -hmm. things, or we're just going to continue to tie ourselves in knots. And I don't think that's what the people of Missouri sent us there to do. What a good idea to have some of the leading statesmen come It was awesome. It head. was really great. You know, and they said a lot of things that were informative, talking about, you know, past precedents and just specific, you know, things that stuck out to them that, that weren't things that were, have been covered or, you know, have made it through the annals of time. Well, I think this is going to be something people talk about going forward. Your inquiry that ended, that ended session this week, uh, late Thursday afternoon, you inquired of Senator Schaff. And again, I think it looked to me to be in response. He's, he's never been overt. I mean, he's, he's done it in a senatorial, but he's questioned the motivations of some of the people that support managed care. You brought up the fact that Senator Schaaf is a, is a doctor, and Senator Schaaf, theoretically, his income could be influenced by this particular piece of public policy. When you went through that, what was the reaction? Well, I think the thing that was, ha had been frustrating to me about some of the things that he had done was this, this uh, sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle mm -hmm implication that people are corrupt simply because they're on the other side of the issue. Yeah. Right. And so I think that's in almost really in any scenario is an unfair characterization and is really, really damaging to our process down there. And so, you know, I have a great deal of respect for Senator Schaaf. He's yeah. obviously proven to be an incredibly effective legislator. <laughs> uh, I, I don't agree with his tactics all the time. I don't agree with his positions all the time. But, you know, he's been elected and reelected a bunch. And so the, the people of St. Joseph and the, and the surrounding mm -hmm. area, they, they, they're okay with what he does uh, for the most part. And so, again, uh, I, I wanted to make sure that, that the, the playing field got leveled a little bit. And so if we're going to bring about these outlandish accusations based on really nothing, uh, other than uh, opposition to a bill, um, that that um, that we call the bully out on the carpet a little bit. So, what was the reaction back in the cloakroom when you're done, from your <laughs> senators? If you don't mind sharing with our yeah, viewers, you know, uh, I think people were surprised that 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 probably what you saw yesterday. People don't presume to be the 
type of person that I am. It's different than. But you did it in a thoughtful way. It yeah, wasn't, and I didn't want, and I, you know, didn't make any. I didn't make any implications. I just sure. laid out a couple of facts, and 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 then people were going to make their own assumptions based on that. And so, yeah, I mean, we got some. Good feedback. I'm sure we're going to get some bad feedback, too. That's the nature of the beast. So going forward, there's three, three weeks of session left. You have to do the budget next week. What do you think the ramifications are of this going forward? Um, you know, I think there probably will be some. Uh, sure. I, I think it was going, the budget process was going to be a tough one anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's obviously been, I'm not breaking any news on your show, that there have been more than a few people who think that we're going to have to go into a special session to pass a budget. And I think that maybe there are some people who want that to happen. And so um, uh, I, I don't know what this specific issue, you know, does as far as I, I think it was going to be a tumultuous yeah, few that, weeks that, anyway. That, that train was heading to that track I, anyway. I, th I think so. Is it the worst thing in the world? People make such a big deal about it. But, I mean, if you're just a regular guy working that has to go to work tomorrow morning, is that the end of the world? If you have to go to a special session yeah, to pass I, a budget? I think, if, I think if you go to a special session to pass a budget for really, really legitimate mm -hmm reasons, then I think that's one thing. I think if we go to special session because a group of individuals has made it their mission to do that, um, just to, to invoke chaos, um, then, then, then you start to talk about, well, should taxpayers be okay with funding a special session and paying mm -hmm. our per diems and those sorts of things, um, just because a couple of, of folks maybe don't like how they've been treated or something like that. So I think that's a, that, that, that's a conversation to have. Well, we got you in here. I want to ask you about a couple other things. Speaking of the state budget, uh, University of Missouri, a lot of folks thought that uh, when the budget chair was no longer from Boone County, Mizzou was in for some pretty significant <laughs> cuts. Somewhere around 9, 30, 10 o'clock on election night with your election, that seemed to go away. They seemed to be faring pretty well in the process. Well, you know, I think they are. It, it, our, part of our objective this year was just to make sure that the university wasn't treated differently. You know, I think last year there was the, the push to say we're going yes. to give two years and four years, accept university this much, and then we're going to mess with the university. Oh, I definitely think a lot of your former House colleagues were, were set on that track. Right. But I think when right. you got elected, that, that subsided. You know, and I think we, I, I tell everybody, I, I love the university. We've made a lot of mistakes in the last two years. We've been arrogant and lazy and naive at times, as specifically as it relates to the relationship with the General Assembly. We have new leadership, a new president, uh, five new curators, uh, three of which have been confirmed, all of whom I think bring a really yep. interesting, diverse perspective. I was at a dinner last night with Daryl Chapman, who's the Democrat from mm -hmm. St. Louis. Great guy, loves the university. Um, I, I think the change in leadership and a better understanding of who we are and who we need to be going forward is is going to be good for the process. And we got a lot of work to do. Influential Republican state senator probably doesn't hurt. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about a couple of things. You've moved some tort reform bills through the Senate. Now they're in the House. Uh, give me a good breakdown on what those are and will they pass? Uh, hopefully yes. Uh, to the to the second question. So they mine were designed to basically uh, resolve a couple Supreme Court cases that both both pieces of legislation want de one dealt with employees uh, physician employees of hospitals mm -hmm. the other one dealt with these time limited demand letters as it relates to insurance claims both were designed to basically bring the pendulum back to the middle as it relates to you know these sorts of litigation cases and both were uh, passed in some form in 2005 uh, one had some bad language and the other one both in both instances the courts, um, basically undid what 2005 law tried to do. And so now we're just clarifying, and I think in a better way, uh, to make sure, just, just to bring some surety to the process, uh, to the litigation process for um, all parties. That's, that's the goal. We don't want to swing the pendulum one, one way or the other too far, uh, but to bring is, it to the middle. If your former colleagues in the House weren't aware of it previously, they certainly are after Thursday afternoon, that they probably should take the Senate version of that, right? I mean, I would say, yeah, uh, well, I would say I, sending it back to the Senate might not bode well. I'm for gonna, it right I, now. I, I, I may make a call to Poplar Bluff sometime <laughs> uh, this weekend to make sure they know the realities. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, last question before you leave: As we come to the end of session, it, it seems to be more of a more of a thing that'll be discussed. You're a, you've been in the House. You understand the moving the previous question of a normal function of business in the House of Representatives in the Senate. What's your views on when or if that should be done? It's got to be really, really rare. Um, you, you know, it, it, I think any time that I'm asked, the first time I'm asked, it's going to be a really, really difficult, re regardless of the issue, yeah. frankly. And I think it part of it has to, back to the, the Callahan-Kinder, you know, thing, mm -hmm. uh, I think it goes to 
where the process has gotten up to there. You know, if the Democrats, if we've been willing to work and we haven't gotten there, maybe the issue should die, right? But if sure. it, in an instance where there hasn't been that camaraderie and that back and forth and it's an issue that our caucus and we think the people of Missouri care about, then I think that that's when you have the conversation. But it's got to be rare. Uh, and, and I think we have to preserve what the Senate is, who, 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 what the power of the individual senator is supposed to be, and preserve that um, with all the strength that we can muster up. Senator, now Senator Brown, thank you for joining us this week in Missouri Politics. Hope you'll come back and talk about the, whatever happens the next three weeks and give us the give us the inside scoop. Thanks, Scott. Thank you very much. We'll be right back with our opinion maker panel. Four representatives joining us this week. We'll see you in a minute. My name is Eric Phillippe. I'm a veteran, a carpenter, and a father. When Eric Greitens said he was going to change politics as usual, folks like me didn't think the first thing he'd do as governor was take dead aim at our jobs and our families' livelihoods by working to repeal prevailing wage. Call Governor Greitens. Tell him to protect prevailing wage and to protect my family, not destroy it. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. Nobody likes power outages, including us. That's why Ameren, Missouri is investing in new equipment and smarter technology to reduce outages and keep pace with future needs. And it's working. We're in the top 25% in the nation for reliability. And on average, our rates are 18% lower than other Midwestern states. Making sure the power is there when you need it. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back. Busy week. We have four legislators to talk about the last three weeks of session. Representative Michael Butler here in St. Louis. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. Representative Tracy McCree, friend of the show. Welcome back. Glad to be here. Welcome back all the way from the, the Herman District. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Representative Alfred, welcome back, sir. Thank you for having me. And for the first time from Jeff County, Representative Rob Biscopo, welcome this week in Missouri Politics. Thanks for having me. What an interesting week for three days. Imagine if it was four days. But how it ended with Senator Rowden, I thought it was, I thought his explanation what was interesting. Frankly, I thought Senator Schaaf had, it stayed on the right line of things, but he had questioned motives of different people. Senator Rowden's inquiry was, was kind of, that brought back to him. It certainly ended the Senate quickly, and where do you think managed care ends up now? You know, I think we still continue down the same path that we were before. Um, I think that uh, the opponents that Schaaf sees on this issue, that they, they aren't there. Um, I think there's more support for managed care than, than he believes there is. Um, so I think it's going to be an interesting week coming forward. Well, it was an interesting week. You've been in these, uh, you've been in these budget committees. Senator Schaub made the motion to take out managed care, and it lost in, in the Senate committee. I think that may give you an indication of where the support is or isn't in the Senate even. I, I think that's absolutely right. If, if, if Senator Schaub wanted to stop managed care, um, then he should have been paying attention two years ago whenever the initial conversation w was had and put into the budget language. We are a couple of months away from the implementation of managed care going statewide. A couple of uh, days, right? Yeah, and so you're not going to be able to reverse that process. We already have a, a contract that has been signed. Um, the, the implications for the state are drastic if managed care is taken out. It, it's simply not going to happen, in my opinion. Um, it, it's just, it's not doable. And, you know, managed care is a, is a way to effectively render our services uh, and to, to both the consumers and both taxpayers as well. I mean, taxpayers are getting a good deal out of it and the consumers on Medicaid are getting a good deal out of it. So I don't understand uh, Senator Schaaf's opposition to it at all. President McCreary, you came on this show. You, you've affected the way I look at things on, on health care. You're probably one of the best, uh, most articulate spokespeople for giving uh, health care services to folks that need it. But when you look at the situation, the growth is not sustainable without cutting significantly or raising taxes, which I think most folks would say is unlikely to do for this. 
the managed care issue, do you think it has the potential to stem those costs and be able to continue to provide the services? Well, well, some studies show that, but the, the solution is so obvious what we need to do, which would be to expand Medicaid. It would, mm -hmm. it would be a tremendous, um, it would just be a tremendous opportunity for the state to um, give care to those that are the working poor. That's what Medicaid expansion would do, and it would free up that money to, to do other important things. But like, I think you'd say the political reality of that's not reality right now. It's not short term, but I truly believe that eventually we will get there. My brother, I thought I, my gut told me, it's a sizable gut, that Donald Trump might go take Obamacare, shuffle it up, rename it, stamp a different name on it, and maybe save the budget process in Missouri. It didn't quite happen that way. Uh, absent of a solution this year, which is obviously not going to come in the next next week when you have to do a budget, managed care is an interesting thing. And I, it looks to me like people talk about Medicaid expansion. I mean, it's doubled the, the cost. It's doubled in five years, ten years. Do you think that managed care has a way to t stem the tide on some of that? No, I mean, well, we're leaving over $100 million on the bottom line of the budget. We're leaving mm -hmm. in a savings account on top of our other savings account. So there's money there without touching managed care. The truth is managed care is really a non-issue uh, with everybody but Mr. Smith. I mean, Senator Schaaf. So it's almost like Mr. Smith goes to Washington, is, and, except there's no, there's no, nothing behind the, uh, the black uh, curtain. There's nothing, there's nothing going on behind except everyone's agreeing and everyone, even the managed care companies are agreeing to take payments later. We're, we, we want to move on with the, with the business of the, of the House and the Senate and, and move on to the next big issue. Representative McCree, I, I have known Senator Schaaf since he was Representative Schaaf. I, I think he's a good man. I think he's an mm -hmm. honest man. I, I'll, I'll defend his integrity. I think maybe it's a little bit of the part of the process where, where legislators are having trouble agreeing to disagree or, or just disagreeing but not saying it's because you took a check from this person. Or I mean, to me, it's a little bit there's some demagogues in politics, there's some demagogues in the media who are obsessed with calling the legislature corrupt. I don't see the corruption. I see people that have honest disagreements. Right. And, you know, I think part, this is part of the result of term limits. I think there's no longer that states per, statesperson-like ambiance in the Senate and the House. And in a weird way, I think us as House members are treating each other more statesperson-like and cordially and professionally than what we're seeing over in the Senate. Representative Alverman, I'm, I'm now old enough to remember uh, the Speaker's father, Mark Richardson, probably the most articulate House member at the time. There was a close vote there. Democrats didn't recognize him. That, that statesman, like, there, I, I think we like to, like, mythologize the old days of saying it was like the Athenian Senate. That's not how I remembered seeing it. <clears throat> I think maybe there's a, the media is a little different. You have a conservative legislature passing conservative laws, and now they're corrupt. When back in the day it was a liberal legislature passing liberal laws, well, I don't remember the corruption charges when I think they would have been a lot more fitting 15 years ago. I think it's, I think it's politically easy to, um, to lob um, erroneous charges of, of yeah, corruption. I agree. Um, and and I, to be honest, I think that's lazy. Uh, that's that's lazy, lazy journalism, and I also think it's lazy uh, politically it's as lazy well. Lazy leadership. I, I don't think that you know um, everyone sitting at this at this table has had political disagreements with me in, in the past. Um, but I, I fundamentally believe all of my colleagues in the House are good people, and they have their best intentions at heart. We may disagree politically, but it's not fair to make uh, personal accusations against my colleagues. Uh, just to make cheap political points, and I think that's what you're seeing in the Senate right now. Mm -hmm. well, I think you know part of this is it's a, there's a time where some of that stuff's been rewarded by the voters, and I think maybe part of that's the media. Maybe it's rewarded with clicks on stories. Do you think maybe the the environment's a little too toxic, and maybe it might be good for folks over the summer to take a do a little perspective on it? Well, I, I think the environment is is always going to be toxic, but if if you want me to say that. Um, as far as his integrity, Schaff's integrity, yeah. I agree. He has integrity. Um, yeah, agree. Representative McCreary and myself, we worked with him when we uh, sued Governor Jay Nixon, you know, yeah. with uh, um, going against the Rams and, and spending taxpayer money without, without the authority of the legislature. I've worked with him on issues, but in my opinion, the way that he's going about um, kicking bills off the House calendar, I think, yeah. I think these are issues that are being handled in a, uh, a manner that a baby would handle these issues. And, and I say that with all due respect to him, but you know, one of, one of my, cons <laughs> one of my, one of my uh, bills were on that consent calendar. Mm -hmm. You don't see me running to, to him and saying, hey, you know, everybody here knows that there are mm -hmm. ways, a uh, hundred ways for a bill to die. And, and it is the leadership's job to put those bills where he wants it. Now, he didn't get his way on where his bill was referred. I didn't get my way on where lots of bills <laughs> yeah, are happens. referred. And that's the way 
the building works. That's why there's so many personalities and we get closer towards the end of the year. We don't get our way and some of us just handle it in a different manner. Representative Butler is interesting to me. So Thursday in the Senate committee, the managed care taking it out gets defeated. Thursday afternoon in the House, his name was invoked while a, a bill went down, which you don't see a lot, mm -hmm. 6082, the transportation bill. Then there was the inquiry. Then Friday morning he wakes up and has this wonderful gift, a dark money committee is giving out his cell phone number. I mean, I you know, I think by any definition, Senator Schaaf had a rough Thursday. Everybody's left Jeff City having a rough Thursday before. <clears throat> he wakes up Friday morning to the wonderful gift of uh, the governor's dark money committee running ads, giving out his cell phone number. This is going to do nothing but help him, right? Yeah, well, you think it's a gift. I, I think uh, when you're trying to do the business of the senator or senator, I, I, that could be a big distraction for him. I probably anyone who's running that dark money uh, organization is it's hoping that it will be but but his I, his crew is not a bunch of P, he, he's not running for office again his his constituents he's probably about a dozen republican senators and maybe five or six democratic senators he works with and i think none of them probably support the dark I think, money i think i just totally agree and it, it's it's very ironic the fact that senator Schaff has been a, a very big uh, opponent of dark money you can against hear this the very thing now yeah so it's <laughs> Uh, I would say that that's been uh, what, what the focus should be more on is the fact that there is a dark money organization. Oh, I think we may from, hear that from the top from the top uh, elected official in the state that who ran uh, against this very mm -hmm. corruption and this very dark money and and that and it's actually attacking another elected official uh, in in the Missouri General Assembly. Another Republican representative. It's an interesting thing. I mean, it's like. It, you know, Senator Shaw's a brilliant guy. And I mean, but sometimes in politics, you need a little luck. Mm -hmm. I think he had a rough Thursday, but boy, I mean, it's like joy comes in the morning. Friday morning, he wakes up to Twitter ads, giving out his, it's a little tacky to give out his cell phone number, right? Yeah. But he, Dr. Schaff, Senator Schaff thrives on this. So this is oh, going yeah. to just I mean, light it's... the fire <laughs> under him. But the thing that I'm embarrassed by is the voters, we're, we're playing right into the hand of what the voters least like about us as elected officials. Yep. Voters just think all we do is fight with each other and I'll be darn, look at this. And we're not doing the work of the people. That and it's embarrassing. You're, you have been a passionate, sincere advocate of ethics reform since the day you walked in the legislature. I think anybody could question your sincerity. I think maybe the analogy would be someone took a howitzer to the ethics bills this year with the dark money ads against Senator Shaw. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, <laughs> unfortunately, that, that has muddied the waters and, uh, of passing a lobbyist gift ban. Um, I think that's unfortunate because I think they are. They're both, both of the topics of dark money and 501c3 or c4s and, and lobbying reform um, need to be addressed. But unfortunately, this issue over here with the dark money is muddying the water over here. I think that they are separate issues and it can be handled separately. Both need to be addressed. I don't, I don't disagree with that, but it's unfortunate that we can't pass this uh, good reform over here because of... Uh, and you could call Representative Offerman at five... I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but let's, let's hey. talk... Let's make, let's make a break here to Circuit Breaker. That was okay. discussed for uh, almost 12 hours in the, <clears throat> uh, in the State Senate this week. You're, uh, you're very familiar with the issue being a leading member on the Budget Committee. What is the Circuit Breaker tax so credit? I, I, was, I was gifted um, House Committee Bill 3 by the, uh, the Budget Committee. That's the first um, House Committee bill um, that, was, uh, that got out of committee this year. Basically what that did was um, we are reinvesting the money of the renter's portion of the Circuit Breaker tax credit or the mm -hmm. or more appropriate name is the property tax credit. Um, we're reinvesting that into the Senior Protection Services Fund. Um, we use that money in the house in, in two basic functions, making sure that um, both in-home health care and nursing care go back down to 21 points of acuity uh, instead of 27. The governor's recommendation was 27. Um, we felt on the budget committee that it needed to be 21. And I think everyone pretty much in the house agrees that it needs to be 21. The difference there is how we get there. Um, so again, I don't want the, the the premise to be that we are eliminating this money for seniors and the disabled. We are reinvesting how we're doing it in a more equitable way, in my opinion. Give me the other side of this. The circuit breaker test code, I heard some very articulate debate on the other side. Uh, the, there's, it, it, the funding is put into a fund called the Senior Services Protection Fund, mm -hmm. and yet it's taking funds from seniors, senior, 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 seniors that, are, that use that to buy services. It's, it's, all, it, it's this oxymoron that, that, that makes us, it's laughable. Uh, honestly, 
this money is taking about $50 million from the lowest income of seniors mm -hmm. in our state who use this money to, as a stopgap. And it was, this has been, a, talk about term, an old agreement that we'd give these circuit breaker tax credits so we wouldn't raise property taxes locally. And yet now these seniors who've been a part of those agreements, who, uh, who, who know, knew about it before, see this agreement going, the younger folks getting in the office and, and d just disregarding what's happened over the years. Interesting mm -hmm. debate. It is sort of moving money around. It, it is. It's a shell game. And these low-income seniors and low-income disabled people, they count on this money. They mm -hmm. budget on this money. It, the average is about $535. And, you know, there was a woman um, featured in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch recently. She was going to use, she had a special piece of medical equipment that she's going to use that money for. So we mm -hmm. cannot just yank the rug out of under, out from under seniors. What do you think? Quickly, I, I, I support the budget chair and his decision to take us down the street. When there is shortfalls, there's got to be tough decisions made. Always. Let's talk about SB 43 for a moment. The, uh, they call it non-discrimination mm -hmm. bill, uh, dealing with discrimination law in the state. Interesting that the House did not bring that up Thursday. Very interesting, and, and uh, we hope they don't bring it up at all this session. Give me the best case against it. The best case against it is that there's a senator who is currently being sued for discrimination, um, and a petition is clearly, has, has come out with a, a, a plaintiff that says that he's been called the N-word, been called discriminated since day one, and uh, I, no one thinks he's lying. And uh, an area in southeast Missouri was circled to not rent anything to an African-American neighborhood. We, I don't think, I think the premise of the bill, the, uh, the fact that this senator is directly involved in what's going on in this bill is totally uh, um, uh, beneath the decorum of the, of, the, mm -hmm. of the body, and that's why I've asked the Attorney General for opinion on what the conflict of interest is. I'll give, I'll give an opinion like on this. Gary Romine for what it's worth. Somebody I know very well, I think he has the utmost integrity. I think sometimes we're getting back into the thing of you impugn the motives of the person carrying the bill. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, look, discrimination is wrong. No one's going to deny that. Um, no one should be discriminating against. I think what Senate Bill 43 tries to do is it says, if you are fired for a reason, um, it, it, and it's not a, um, it needs to be a motivating factor for discrimination and not a contributing factor. I think there's a big difference between a reason and the reason. Do you pass the bill the other day? I think we do. With a minute left, who won the week? I think uh, Scott Fitzpatrick for showing the Senate that you can pass a budget. Uh, with no controversy and also funding the priorities of the state. Representative Vescola, who won the week? Sonia Anderson on House Bill 608. She took a lot of grief and she put some hard work into that and really has, has come out looking great. Representative McGree, who won the week? Auditor Nicole Galloway for standing mm -hmm. up for Missouri taxpayers and making sure that they get their income tax refunds as quickly as possible. Who won the week? I think Senate Democrats, especially their leader Gina Walsh, for stopping a circuit Probably breaker true. in the Senate. Good week. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say Representative Glenn Kolkmeyer. I mean, whenever you're a representative and you're getting serenaded on the Senate floor, I mean, you're, you're doing something that gets mm -hmm. attention. Badge of honor. I want to thank all of you guys for being here. We look forward to covering the last three weeks of session. We look forward to for welcoming you back to talk about it in this week in Missouri politics. This Week in Missouri Politics, brought to you by Spire and Sterling Bank.